Well, good evening and welcome to Straight Science, everyone. And thanks for the, the patience in the waiting room. My name's Gay Sheffield and Straight Science is a public science evening presentation series put on by UAF Northwest Campus, which you're in right now, and UAF Alaska Sea Grant, and that would be myself. We both UAF Northwest Campus and UAF Alaska Sea Grant, we are public servants of the Bering Strait region. We serve the Bering Strait region, which is the homeland and waters of the Inupiaq, Yupik, and St. Lawrence Island Yupik peoples. Tonight is a, is a different one. My mother always said, don't try something new when you have company, over, company coming over for dinner. The thing is, we haven't done a hybrid since March of 2020. We haven't done a hybrid ever, but since March of 2020, we have not had an in-person straight science. And tonight we're doing that because we have the great pleasure of having actually a, a gentleman from Washington itself. And um, for an introduction, we have Dr. Richard Spinrad. Richard Spinrad was sworn in in 2021 and he is the Under Secretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere and the 11th NOAA Administrator. And I had to look that up. What is NOAA Administrator? What does he administrate? There are six major programs. Some may sound familiar to us in the Bering Strait region. Here are the programs he is responsible for. The National Weather Service, National Marine Fisheries Service, National Ocean Service, National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Service, Office of Marine and Aviation Operations, and Office of Oceans and Atmospheric Research. So uh, we are very excited to introduce Richard Spinrad. He is responsible for the strategic direction and oversight of all those uh, agencies, including developing their portfolios, addressing the climate issues, enhancing environmental sustainability, fostering economic development, and creating a more equitable workforce. Sounds fantastic. And tonight, um, I guess I should give you a little bit more on Dr. Spinrad. So prior to joining NOAA, Dr. Spinrad was also working at the U.S. Office of Naval Research and Oceanography of the Navy, and he was awarded the Distinguished Civilian Service Award, and that is the highest award given by the U.S. Navy to a civilian. So that was pretty interesting. And for us in Alaska, especially in the education world, Dr. Spinrad developed the National Ocean Science Bowl for high school students, and that is a, that's a big deal for us here and throughout Alaska, so that's pretty exciting. He is the recipient of the Presidential Rank Awards from President both George Bush and Barack Obama. So this is a highly qualified man to come and tell us more about his direction and where NOAA and all those programs, uh, what it's going to mean for us in the Arctic. So I'll hand it off to Dr. Spinrad. Let's hear about NOAA's Arctic goals. We're so excited, honestly. It's very exciting. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you, Jay. And I'm going to show. Hey, Gay, sorry to interrupt. Can you unmute Dr. Spinrad? Spin right? Okay, I need an audio check from somebody on the uh, on the call here. Can anybody let me know whether you can hear me? We've got you loud and clear. Thank you. Either give me audio. Thank you. Lauren Fields, you get the gold medal. Right. Appreciate it. Um, so uh, let me, yeah, anybody in the room here have a problem? Okay, great. Thank you for that. So for those of you on the call here, I just want to repeat my thanks. Uh, first of all, to Gay, to the uh, folks on campus here, and obviously to Alaska Sea Grant. It really is a treat. I'm looking at the list of names, and there's a number of uh, my past colleagues and friends. I won't call you out by name. You know who you are. 
some of whom I will see when I uh, get to Fairbanks later on this trip. Um, I have something like six pages of notes here that staff put together. I'm not gonna use them. <laughs> and I'm not gonna use them because I had, uh, first of all, I've, I've been uh, in the state since uh, late Sunday, and I had a really interesting discussion with Amy Holman, who's here with us in Nome. I'm not in the audience right now. She will be shortly. And we were talking about this presentation, and she basically said, let's have a conversation here. So I want to keep my comments relatively short. Uh, and I do want to get to NOAA priorities and agency priorities, but I want, you to tell, I want to tell you a little bit about myself first so you, you know who's talking to you. Yeah, and I'm a D.C. bureaucrat. I'm coming in from D.C. Uh, but I hope what I'm bringing to the table is a little bit of a different perspective. So let me start by saying in 1975, I was 21 years old. You can do the math, figure it out. And um, I just graduated from college. And I had a little bit of time before I started my graduate work. And I decided to hitchhike around the country, around the North America, and ended up getting a great ticket on the ferry out of Prince Rupert. And I had a freshly minted degree, undergraduate degree in Earth and Planetary Sciences. And I knew I was going to go to graduate school to study ocean sciences at Oregon State University. And I uh, sailed up, I camped out on the forward deck, you know, as a student would do, of course, on the ferry and got to Haines, hitchhiked to Haines Junction, hitchhiked all the way to um, Beaver Creek in Yukon, and I couldn't hitchhike any further. And it, it teased me. I wanted to get to Alaska. And so I decided at that point that there was so much going on here, I was going to find ways to get to Alaska. That was 47 years ago, right? And I ended up uh, doing my research, getting a, a degree in underwater optics, basically, how light works in the ocean. And as a result, I ended up getting a job for the Navy because that was the height of the Cold War. And the Navy was really interested in non-acoustic anti-submarine warfare. And if any of you read any of the Tom Clancy novels, The Hunt for Red October, the work I was doing was really exciting to the Navy. So I ended up first as a contractor to the Navy, as a kind of traditional academic researcher. And then I ended up managing the Navy's programs. And I did that for uh, quite a few years back in DC. So I was the one who got to write the checks and pass out the money to the researchers, a few of whom are on this call, in fact, to study aspects of oceanography. And I did that basically until the Cold War ended in the early 90s. And um, basically spent a few years trying to figure out where I might be able to add some value with the knowledge I'd, I'd gained to that point. And right about that time, it was actually late, about 10 years later, I got a call from the guy who was running NOAA at that time, a, a fellow named uh, Admiral Conrad Lautenbacher. And he asked me, would I like to run the National Ocean Service, one of the lines that you just heard Gay allude to, one of the parts of the agency. So the National Ocean Service is that part of NOAA that, for example, produces the navigational charts. And I know everybody in NOAA knows navigational charts. Uh, the National Ocean Service also includes the National Geodetic Survey. In fact, we ran into some surveyors at the airport just about an hour ago. These are the folks who do a lot of the surveys for airports, for example, to figure out how out, uh, heights of uh, the runways are changing. Anyway, I thought, well, that'd be kind of cool. So I went to work for the National Ocean Service, and that's where I got bitten by a different bug. And that bug was understanding the environment for the benefit of people in terms of three things, lives, livelihoods, and lifestyles. And you think about that, lives, how do we protect people's lives? And I'll, I'll get into some of the specifics on how that plays out here in Alaska in a few minutes. Livelihoods, it's jobs. And lifestyle is, think recreation, think ecotourism. And I thought, this is pretty cool. I really like this, this mission. And then I found out that in the National Ocean Service, we had all sorts of interesting capabilities here in Alaska. And that's when I took my first trip to Homer because we have a National Estuarine Research Reserve in Kachemak Bay right there in Homer. And I, I saw some amazing things. First of all, I saw ecosystems 
different from anything I was familiar with. But I also saw an engagement by our community and with a community, unlike anything I had ever seen before. So I did that for a few years. And then the head of NOAA uh, asked me if I would move over and lead NOAA research. Uh, there's actually an interesting story about that for, I don't know everybody on the call. So if there's any young folks early in their career on their call, I'll tell you, uh, remember I was the head of the National Ocean Service and there were some real questions about NOAA's research activity. Congress had some real problems with NOAA's research activity. So Congress threatened to shut down NOAA's research and the head of NOAA, this guy, Admiral Lautenbacher said, whoa, 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 let's do a study. Let's bring in an outside group to study NOAA uh, research. And Congress said, okay. And they said, but you ought to have one inside person on that, on that. They called it a blue ribbon, blue ribbon panel. I was the guy they called on. They said, you be the inside guy. So I said, fine, I didn't know any better. Sure enough, a year later, we put out a report, had a bunch of recommendations and the head of NOAA said, hey, why don't you go implement those recommendations? Why don't we move you over to the other, uh, the other part of the organization? So message to self, be careful when you volunteer for an internal assessment of your own organization. But I happily went over to NOAA Research. And that, the interesting there, thing there was I started seeing some of the, the capabilities and needs, but also some of the shortcomings and the measurements we are making. How do we know how much carbon is in the atmosphere? How do we know what's happening to circulation, especially off the North Slope? And it turns out that NOAA has extraordinary capabilities throughout the state for satellite data acquisition in Fairbanks, for Arctic research in Fairbanks, writ, writ general, writ, writ broadly, and then for things like observations of climate in Utkiakve. So I've had visits to uh, Fairbanks to Utkiakve in February, because we decided that everybody goes up to Utkiakve in July and August, we ought to see what our folks were doing in February. So six years ago, I went up there. At that point, I was chief scientist for NOAA. So I share this with you to say that uh, I've had a number of experiences and then many other trips. This is my fir first trip to Nome, but many other trips to other parts of the state Juno and Southeast, to talk with folks about what our capabilities are and what we can do. So let me transition now. You've got a little sense of who I am. I, start, I should point out, I started my career assuming I would be a traditional academic researcher, that I would get my doctoral degree, that I would be an assistant professor, that I would uh, get into a tenure track position, compete for federal funding for research. And I did start out that way, but this opportunity to Influence research, drive the agenda was really, it, it was almost intoxicating to me. I really thought this is where that there can be great opportunity, great uh, uh, engagement, challenges. And I just found it fascinating. And, and the important thing there is I had to make a decision in my career. Did I want to continue to be a researcher or did I want to drive the research agenda and drive policy? And I actually thought I was probably better at the latter than I was at the former. And so I said, I think I want to do that. And, and ultimately, after all of these various careers, I, I re actually retired from the federal government in 2010, uh, went back to what was then my home in Oregon. And then in 2014, I was given the opportunity to come back as NOAA's chief scientist. I did that for a few years. 2016, I retired again. And then in 2021, I was honored to be asked by the uh, Biden administration to be considered for this particular position. So the message there is I've obviously, I can't keep a job, but I've failed retirement twice already. So I came to NOAA and I said, uh, in fact, when I interviewed for this position with the Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo, the other lesson in life that I learned, I talked to you about, be careful when you volunteer for an internal assessment, you may be the one carrying it out. The other lesson I, I sort of learned was, you know, I was retired. I didn't need another job. And so I could be very free in saying what I thought we needed to do. And I liked what I heard coming out of this administration. And I said, I think in an agency like NOAA, there's three specific things we need to do. And I'm gonna use those three things I'm gonna, I'm gonna share with you what those three things are. 
And then I'm going to do a deeper dive specifically with regard to what's going on in Alaska. So the first is we're in a place now where changes in climate are no longer a theoretical concept. They are happening. And yet we do not have an established place to get the authoritative information that we need to serve any number of needs. And so my first goal is to establish a capability for authoritative climate products and services, think information to serve multiple needs. We are framing that concept in something we call a climate ready nation. And the goal is by 2030, we could declare that we are a climate ready nation. So that was job number one. Job number two is if, if you look, those of you on the screen, there, I'll show it to you. I'm wearing my NOAA shirt. I got my NOAA logo on my shirt here. If you look carefully, it says that I actually serve in the Department of Commerce. And when Gay introduced me, you pointed out, I do have two titles. One is as the administrator of NOAA. That's kind of looking into the organization. How is the weather service doing? How is the ocean service doing? The other job that I have is as an undersecretary for the Department of Commerce. So I serve as the Undersecretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere. I make a sharp point of that because the role of the Department of Commerce is about commerce. It's about economic development. It's about trade. How can we in NOAA help develop new economic opportunities? So that's the second pillar, that we will build out new economic opportunities around what I like to call environmental intelligence. I'll come back to that. The third critical pillar is building equity into everything we do. And I think of equity as a lens in the sense that one aspect of equity is looking out to the stakeholders, the customers, the users of our information and services and making sure that we are providing products, services, information, support, edu educational opportunities to all communities with a particular emphasis on those that are most vulnerable and have traditionally been underserved. When you turn that lens the other way into the organization, equity is about diversification, accessibility, giving every NOAA employee and partner a sense of belonging to the mission, belonging to the agency, and also making sure that our agency is reflective of the demographics and population that we serve. And it's not right now, if you look at the demographics of our agency. So that means trying to bring in whole different segments of uh, the demographic for the American population and make the NOAA workforce look like the American population. So those are the three key pillars. And as I look around at where, first of all, climate change is having impacts and where we might be able to demonstrate effectiveness on those pillars, climate ready nation, economic development, equity. Alaska is, I would say, ripe with opportunities for demonstrating impact and improvement. Now, I could walk through this a number of ways. I could walk through this by talking about each of the line offices, the National Ocean Service, the National Weather Service, et cetera, et cetera. But that would be defeating for the main cause that I'm trying to get, which is what we call a one NOAA cause. That when you get right down to it, Mother Nature doesn't discriminate between what happens in the ocean, what happens in the atmosphere. You all here in Nome know that as well or better than I do. The nature of storms is just as much dependent on what's going on right over there. Sorry, I'm pointing to the water for those of you on the screen, um, as well as what's going on up above us in the atmosphere. So, and I'll say a little bit more about that, but, but uh, in terms of the one NOAA approach, the climate ready nation approach, what are the kinds of things that we can look into? The economic development is an interesting one. I believe strongly that there is an opportunity for building out a whole new economic sector 
Um, and actually, by some estimates, this economic uh, uh, sector is estimated to be at least a $100 billion market. And that market is on environmental services. So think of commercial weather, okay? Um, I won't insult people in the room by asking you your age, but there are some of you in the room here, and I suspect on the screen, who remember before we had uh, the Weather Channel or AccuWeather. And I remember when those companies started up, and I said, no way. Nobody's going to watch weather 24 hours a day on TV. This is not going to happen. Those are very lucrative businesses right now. There's about a $10 billion industry for commercial weather. That's just weather. That's just the traditional kinds of weather products. Imagine now building out a similar industry for holding up the Gnome Nugget front page, which I saw right when I checked in um, about half an hour ago. The headline is researchers find high concentrations of harmful algae in regional waters. That kind of information, how you take that kind of information, tailor it to the needs of particular communities is an opportunity for building out um, a whole new market. And if I was talking to a group of farmers, there's a market opportunity for agricultural uh, products based on climate. There is an aspect of this build out of economic development that's specific to the ocean. So I'll tell you another quick story. There's a guy, when I was running the National Ocean Service 20 years ago, uh, we decided we would put all of our data out on the web. This is a new creative thing. Nobody was doing that, that we would take the data that you all as taxpayers are paying for and make it available much more easily. So you didn't have to phone up or call a friend, but you could actually get on the web and get all the data. I get a call one day from this guy down in Florida who says, I'm going to sue you. I said, really? Why? He said, you're competing with me. I have a business. I said, what's your business? He said, I take the data from NOAA and I put it on my own website and I sell it to people. I said, let me make sure I understand this. So you're taking the data people have already paid for, because we've all paid for it, and you're going to package it up and sell it to them again? He said, yep. And I said, go for it. Sue away, because um, you don't have an argument to make. And I didn't think he had a business plan. To his credit, this guy went back and decided what he did have a market for was taking those data and packaging them up developing unique products and services for a particular market. So he looked and he said, you know, the recreational sport fishing tournament industry is a rich opportunity. Turns out people will pay a lot of money if you can tell them where the tarpon are, or the sailfish, that um, he could develop a product based on data using sea surface temperature, and then he could sell it. And that guy started a booming business. And in fact, it's still in business. I call that the new blue economy. I call it the new blue economy because it's an economy based on not extracting anything from the ocean except numbers, data, and then making information out of that that people will value. Think about it, insurance, reinsurance, emergency managers, county managers, county planners, hospitals, public health uh, professionals, want tailored information. It, another interesting story, this headline recalls for me, again, when I ran the National Ocean Service, we actually developed a HAB, harmful algal bloom forecast for the Eastern Gulf of Mexico. It's really good. And um, the problem we had was, how do we get it out there? We ended up finally working with the National Weather Service, that's that one NOAA thing, right? to get that product out. And it turns out the public health community, that was in Tampa, St. Pete, Florida, were ecstatic because if they knew that a harmful algal bloom was gonna set off, let's say today on Thursday, that by Saturday or Sunday, if the wind conditions were right, they were gonna have a whole bunch of respiratory admittances into the hospital because that particular species called Corinia brevis actually emits stuff in the air that causes real bronchial and respiratory problems. So you know there is real value in this information. So when I look at the opportunities around economic development here in Alaska, for example, I ask how much is an accurate forecast of what's gonna happen 
with the salmon runs worth? And we know what's happening with salmon runs, right? If we can provide a reasonably accurate seasonal forecast along those lines, what's it worth? Now, I'm not suggesting that you have to buy all of that. We have a responsibility in the public sector to build the fundamental information so that the fishing communities will have the service that they pay us for. And oh, by the way, all this stuff that I'm talking about from NOAA, the weather forecasts and navigational charts, the climate data, you know how much it costs each of you as a taxpayer per day? Six cents. Six cents. So when I go to Congress, I say, imagine what you could get for a dime, right? <laughs> so, so this is an extraordinary service meeting the needs for lives, livelihoods, and lifestyles. On the equity side, so I talked a little bit about climate services. Um, it, there are so many examples I could come up with, and I've just only spent a few days here already, but, but I, I was chatting with our folks in the Weather Service about the, their product to support the walrus subsistence hunting. So can we provide a forecast so that the trails out to the hunting ground are predictable and the hunters will know where to go? Our sea ice forecasts. We were talking earlier before we started about some of the folks who come in here, some of the folks in sailboats and uh, uh, tourist uh, vessels, they're gonna to wanna to know where the ice is. I got a question from one of the chief, one of the executives at a major shipping company he said, can you tell me with an eight week lead time when the Arctic will be ice free for six weeks? That's an extraordinary request. And, and that's right, we can't do that yet. But if we could, imagine how valuable that would be. Imagine how valuable that ultimately would be to a community like here in Nome. I just got here. I don't know all of the issues in Nome. I know what my staff tells me. I know what I read. I'm really looking forward over the next two days to get a lot smarter about the kinds of issues we've got here. I want to talk about equity because uh, this is another one where I think there are so many critical examples here. And in fact, we spent the morning uh, at the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium in Anchorage talking about a pilot project that we are working with them. That's intended to do a few things, not the least of which is develop a much more robust mechanism for incorporating indigenous knowledge into these kinds of predictive models that I was talking about. You talk to the elders in many of the tribes, they've seen climate change coming for decades. They probably have some good ideas about what's gonna happen in the future. Are we incorporating that thinking into our physics-based uh, com computationally intensive models? We need to do a better job of that. We need to do a better job of making sure that we are not simply delivering products to communities, ice breakup forecasts, for example, but we are actually understanding by working with communities, what kind of information would you like how would you like to get that information? And how do you wanna work with us on a regular basis? One of the things that struck me just in the short time I've been in the state, and we've been in Juneau, Anchorage, Homer, Kenai, now Nome, is that um, in several of the offices, I've heard a number of our office directors say, we have a hard time getting people into these offices, meteorologists, hydrologists, uh, because we have a hard time recruiting people to come up from the lower 48 to come work here. And I'm thinking, well, what's wrong with that picture? If we truly effectively develop an engagement concept of operations, that shouldn't be a problem anymore because many of our native colleagues would now be saying, we are your hydrologists, we are your meteorologists, we are your uh, uh, fishing experts. And we, at that point, that would be a real success in my opinion, fully incorporating with local communities, with the tribes, uh, the indigenous knowledge, but also the human resource. So there'd be jobs, there'd be better products, there'd be better understanding. I wanna, I realize I've been going on and on uh, for a few minutes here. I want, I wanna do a quick run through of the agency. And in this case, I will do it sort of line office by line office to give you some sense of how our scientific challenges 
directly affect lives, livelihoods, and lifestyles and are part of our critical thinking. And um, if I think about, let's start with the fishery service. So we run the National Marine Fishery Service. I gave you an example of getting a better handle on the runs, uh, but it's, it's also getting a handle on uh, what's gonna happen, for example, to Pollock over the next 20, 30 years. What's gonna happen to crab populations? Have we done enough work with genetics so that we can really nail down where the salmon are coming from, where they're going to, and how much of what we're seeing may be due to uh, environmental effects, uh, a warm pool in the North Pacific? How is bycatch affecting populations of salmon? Those are the kinds of things that are really so critical in a state that provides 60% of our seafood in the United States. And as Senator Sullivan is fond of telling me, every time I talk with him, has more coastline than the rest of the United States all put together, how do we map and chart that, especially in a dynamic environment where storms are getting severe, where you have communities that no longer have the protection of sea ice during certain times of the year, so the wave structure, the wave dynamics are different. How do we map and chart these environments. When we talk about a deep water port here in Nome, what are the requirements for mapping and charting and how good will those charts be five years from now, 10 years from now? You all know much better than I do about the impact on coastal communities of changes in sea level or changes on permafrost. We had a great discussion this morning about a community that is considering moving most of its major infrastructure. And my question was, how do we know where the right place is? To move that infrastructure? How do we know what water levels are going to be, sea level is going to be, permafrost situation in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? Yes, we have to do something now. Alaska is the place that I have used in my arguments back in DC and will now do so even more strenuously when I argue that the current agenda and you all saw it, the bipartisan infrastructure law was passed. Recently, the Inflation Reduction Act was passed. We got large amounts of money for coastal resilience in NOAA, billions of dollars over the next five years, billions. A lot of money going, is going into the climate agenda right now to decarbonize, to invest in renewables, to put offshore wind out, to think about different fuel systems, to enhance solar and, and uh, terrestrial-based uh, wind power. Absolutely, we have to do that. If we did that tomorrow, if we got to net zero tomorrow, those communities in coastal Alaska would still need to re-engineer their infrastructure. They still would be facing questions about relocating. And people in Virginia would still have to contend with 12 to 14 inches of sea level rise by 2050. So when we start thinking about the activities of our National Ocean Service, we have, I'm, I'm so proud to say, we've got NOAA Corps officers here in the room. There's another one of, of our NOAA Corps officers back in Anchorage who spend their time out on the ships doing surveys. I don't care how long they spend on those ships, we're never gonna adequately be able to survey. We have such an extraordinary backlog. So that begs an interesting scientific question. Is there technology out there now that we can use to complement the traditional approaches, things like robotic systems, uh, autonomous uh, surface vehicles, for example. There's an extraordinary new company down in, in California called SailDrone that builds basically uh, unoccupied, autonomous, robotic sailboats. And I'm not talking little things the size of this, this desk. They have one that's about 70 feet long right now. Can go around the world. We can probably equip those things with similar sensors to what we use on our ships to map and chart and not replace the ships, but start complementing that activity. And here's a cool idea. Those same ships could actually map and count fish for us too and do stock assessment. So when you look at technological solutions, there really are some extraordinary capabilities and they weren't around 10, 20 years ago. So we've talked about fisheries, we've talked a little bit about the ocean service. 
What about the weather service? Man, what about the weather? Is the weather different now for you here in Nome than it was 20 years ago? Yeah. I, I like to tell people, it's not my phrase, you've heard a million times before, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. So folks on the lower 48 all got excited when they learned about the polar vortex a few years ago. The important thing is people understood that the weather system is driven by some incredible phenomena. And a few years back, uh, some of our scientists at NOAA discovered these atmospheric rivers. Some people called them pineapple expresses. And the thinking was that these were very rare, uh, highly specific to just particular areas, that they were very, very um, moist streams of water in the upper atmosphere that resulted in very heavy rain. I lived in Oregon. I remember we would get these real heavy rains. Um, and it turns out that they're not that rare and they're not that infrequent. And I was just talking with our folks in the weather forecast office in Juneau who are now seeing, they've always been coming into Southeast Alaska, but now we're getting a much better handle on how to observe them, detect them with our satellites and predict them. And these things account for about 70% of the total annual precipitation. So what other kind of patterns do we need to take a look at? And I don't need to tell you all, making observations of weather in this state is extraordinarily difficult. Uh, where, where there's not remoteness, there's mountains. Where there's not mountains, there's real strong winds. There's a lot of water. So trying to figure out how do we use our observational capabilities and our sophisticated models to improve weather forecasting here in Alaska is an extraordinary challenge. I mentioned satellites. You heard Gay refer to one of our line offices uh, that is responsible for satellites. I'm responsible as no administrator for 16 satellites, 15 ships, and nine aircraft. We have our own Navy. We have our own <laughs> Space Force. We have our own Air Force. Those satellites, uh, a lot of the data come down in Fairbanks as one of our major acquisition facilities. And we have extraordinary capabilities with our colleagues in Fairbanks, Fairbanks for developing new ways, sophisticated ways of using those satellite data to detect things like sea ice and to measure the depth of snow in the mountains. So that's our NESDIS piece. NESDIS, as we call it, the National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Service is where all of our data are stored too. So anytime you want to get a piece of data from NOAA, you go on the web and want to figure out, hey, what's the, what's the last 10 years of sea surface temperature look like uh, in, the, uh, in the Beaufort Sea, the Bering Sea? You're going to NESDIS to get that. We have a research line office that uh, basically supports all of these activities I was talking about. And then at the foundation, is our capability to go out and take measurements. So our Office of Marine and Aviation Operations, those 15 ships that I alluded to, and the 321 wonderful NOAA Corps officers that we have are how we are able to make those observations. So we fly the King Air aircraft here in Alaska. We operate our hydrographic survey vessels, our fishery survey vessels. And then we also have research vessels that come in, especially in the Gulf of Alaska, to collect some of those data. So. Thank you for letting me walk through my family here of capabilities and on. And, and I do want to have time for, for dialogue and go back and forth, but I wanted you all to get a sense of, first of all, who's, who I am, uh, some of the passion I've got for doing this. Um, I, I tell people, our agency is here to save the world. And I mean it. It, it sounds hyperbolic. We are here to save the world. What an extraordinary mission. And the leading edge in terms of impacts on climate change, on fisheries, on ocean conditions is right here, right here in Alaska. So when my staff said, let's go out and take a look at Alaska, um, and they said, we know you don't like to take long trips. It's not that I don't like, it's just that the job back in DC, it's hard to take long trips. They came back and they said, we have a seven day option we could put together. I said, no, can't do it in seven days. It's got to be longer than that. <laughs> and so we're taking 10 days on this trip. Um, like I said, we were down in Juneau, been in Anchorage, went down to, we're, we were at the Kenai Classic uh, yesterday. I floated down the Kenai for a while. We walked, we trudged through 
uh, knee deep muck and mud in the estuary down in Homer, Hatchmack Bay National Estuary and Research Reserve. We visited with the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium this morning. Then we flew out here. Uh, I, actually, we stopped in Anchorage because my wife insisted on, that I pick up some kiviat for her. She's an avid knitter, so I did that in Anchorage too. And then we uh, will be heading back to uh, Anchorage and then Fairbanks, where I know I'm going to see some of the folks who are on the call here uh, later in the week. So let me just stop there and say, you know, we're about science, service, and stewardship. We're trying to impact lives, livelihoods, and lifestyles. And I am truly delighted to be able to share with you a little of my passion and talk to you a little bit about, you know, not do a deep dive on the science, although I'm happy to do that. If you want to ask me anything about any of those scientific issues, let's do that. But here are your questions and concerns. So thank you. Let's open it up. Thank you. All right. Now we may have to be in tandem here. Let's hope Should I pull up the chat on here? Would no, that help? Nope, that that won't help. But I'm just hoping. <laughs> I don't want to say it, right? That's the only thing I'm worried about. Okay. So, so, so thank, thank you, Dr. Spinrad, for bringing that to Great science. science. And for all, everyone, in the, uh, before we get to your questions in the chat, chat now, now is the time, time to, to, while you're thinking of your questions, show Dr. Spinrad a little love of Great Science in the chat. Oh, there is a bad addict. Okay. There, I can mute here. Go ahead. Uh, and I'll just. All right. We'll tag team. Hopefully, is that done with the echo? Is the echo gone? All right. Great. We're going to tag team. It's going to take a little uh, tandem coordination here. So while, um, while you're thinking of your question, show Dr. Spinrad a little love in the chat. It's not easy to come in flying into a place you've never been and deliver straight science within 15 minutes of walking into the building. I don't even know if he's checked into his hotel. So uh, we very much appreciate his, his ability to do that. Yes, absolutely, that's for you. Um, so I'm gonna, let's see, raise your hand if you can and I think I've unmuted people. All right. Well, our first question is going to be from Emma Pate. Let me um, go ahead, Emma. All right. Now, I guess. Emma, are you on? All right. I don't know where Emma went. She might have hit the wrong button or I may be messing that up. All right, Wes Jones, we see you're up. Can you unmute Wes? Oh, I see, all right, try now. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for, and, and it's, it's great to hear uh, the presentation. Um, I just wanted to say that for for our region that we've we've been seeing change you know drastic changes and one of the things that it, I think is really important to see is the idea of how you expect fish like fish species and species uh, ranges to change over the next several years um, in that we have to be able to adapt what we're doing now And, and, you know, look at what's, what species will, will we be able to, you know, rely on in the future if, if, if certain species goes away. Um, one point that it, to me that's, that's also I wanted just to highlight is it, I do really appreciate that, that uh, NOAA has stepped up and been doing the Northern Bering Sea Trawl Survey now um, since 2017. Um, uh, they, they've started that back up and that's been really beneficial. And I would like, it would, I think it'd be also really beneficial to see that survey move into the Chukchi to truly understand how, how the fish moving north in the Bering Sea and into the Chukchi, how, the, how they're actually working together. Um, 
I think would be would be is a is a very something very important that's not being looked at currently. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Wes. Now I'm going to mute. Yeah. Thank you, Wes. So we're uh, sorting out the way to for me to be able to hear the questions. I think we got it sorted out. Uh, really great question. I really appreciate that. So first of all, thank you for your comment on moving the or expanding the uh, Northern Bering Sea Trawl Surveys in Chukchi Sea. That's, I think, really important, especially in the broader context of knowing what's going to happen in the Central Arctic with respect to uh, potential fishing activities there. So having a broader uh, sense of where the fish are. I want to get to your main uh, question, uh, which was about understanding fish uh, changes, the biogeography of fish. Where are they? And, and you know, the short answer is we're just learning about the concept of uh, climate migration speeds. There's actually a velocity of climate. There are climate scientists who talk about how, fa how fast things are moving. I'll give you an example from my old state, Oregon, where we now know that the Douglas fir forests are migrating north one kilometer per year. So we're trying to get similar sort of understanding. What can we say uh, about the kings? What can we say about chum salmon? All five critical species, what can we say about crabs? What can we say about pollock? We, in order to do that, we need to understand the factors that influence that behavior, whether it's temperature, whether it's the currents, whether it's the availability of prey, in which case, uh, how do we understand where the phytoplankton, then zooplankton are, then the, the higher trophic levels? So we've been investing for 20 years in a program called ECOFOCI, which is basically fisheries oceanography and climate impacts. And we're now using the data from ECOFOCI, and I suspect we've got some of the ECOFOCI researchers here on the call, to address that. It's not just simply a matter of saying, yeah, everything's going to move north, and they're going to move north by uh, you know x miles per hour or per year. It's a matter of understanding between the species, and I would also argue between the genotypes, the specific strains, if you will, of species which are driven very much by where they spawn, what's going to affect them and how are they going to move. We're getting a better handle on that, but I can't give you an answer and say everything's moving north by you know, 10, 10 miles per year, but I'm pretty sure we're going to be in a place where we're going to be able to say species by species, here's a much better, what we would call an ecological forecast on how that's going to change. Thanks for that question. It's it's a really critical one. Did that get your question, Wes? Yes, it was great. Thank you very much. All right. And Emma, I'm sorry about that. I had I was slow on this unmute business. I think my mother was right all along. But go ahead, Emma. So I have a question about the um, information and no networking that comes from NOAA funded research in this area. Um, so as you've seen in the Gnome Nugget newspaper, uh, we, we had the opportunity to coordinate with a research vessel um, and that was new and that's something that's not typical and from what i understand in the networking that i work through for HABs and phytoplankton monitoring um there's a lot of there are a lot of organizations out there that are funded but they all seem to be fragmented at this point and so we're all working to attempt to network on the administrative and management side with these with all these different organizations and i work for norton sound health corporation which is a tribal consortium and i coordinate with um, alaska sea grant the alaska harmful algal bloom network and um any any other organization that is involved in phytoplankton monitoring. So um, we were fortunate to connect with this research vessel, the Norseman II, which 
is sampling throughout the Bering Strait region and beyond. Um, but that brought some questions up as to how many other research vessels are out there and how often do they notify the region before they travel into the region to do a project like the Norseman 2 is doing currently. So we are more prepared in the future for something um, like the recent Alexandrium mm -hmm. counts that came up in their sampling. Um, we're just in the beginning stages of starting our phytoplankton monitoring program. And um, fortunately, we had some re relationships established to come across the Norseman too, but it also brought up a lot of questions for future vessels coming into our region. Is there a plan in place to have all these fun? So Emma, thank you. And um, Gay has been great here. She showed me, it's actually your picture here on the uh, front of the, uh, Gnome Nugget, so now I know who I'm talking with. Um, a couple of thoughts. I think this issue of coordinating activities is always going to be a tough one. I mentioned uh, during my discussion that one of the developments of our looking into uh, climate inequity and the roundtables we did around the country is the development of this pilot project that we're doing with the Alaskan Native Tribes Health Consortium. Um, and part of that is to find out how to get better connectivity. So uh, offline, we can make sure to get you information. Amy Holman's here in the room, and we'll try to make sure you're aware of that particular pilot because there, there will be opportunities for that joint discussion through the pilot. It's one, of the, it's one of the objectives to address the kind of partnering and coordination that you just alluded to. The other thing I will share with you is you mentioned Sea Grant, and obviously, my first reaction to a question like that, no, what, no matter where I am in the coastal US is to say, are you working with Sea Grant? Sea Grant is an extraordinary networking tool. Uh, I know you are, uh, but I would say if there's more we can do through Sea Grant, I'd like to know that. If you see opportunities there, and obviously through Gay and the team, that's a good way of making sure we get that through there. Um, Gay also was uh, noting for me that uh, the, the, some of the funds for this particular project are NSF based and in fact involved one of my uh, colleagues, Don Anderson, which is great. Don is a terrific researcher. Um, I've been concerned about how we're working with NSF and, and a lot of times we find out, yeah, there's things NSF is doing, especially through a program they've just started called Coasts and People. They call it COPE, C-O-P-E. I have a regular meeting with the NSF director, a guy named Ponchanathan, they call him Ponch, Dr. Ponch. Um, and he and I are, trying to establish better ways for NSF funding and NOAA funding to be coordinated more efficiently. And in fact, we're having a summit this fall. So if there is information about where you see NSF investments and NOAA investments having a potential for greater bang for the buck, man, I'd love to hear that too. And if you can you know, get that through Gay and Amy to us, that would be a great uh, additional bit of information. So I would say those three angles, the, uh, the climate and equity pilot we're doing with ANTHC, the Sea Grant connection, and then the potential that we could uh, up our game with how we work with NSF are three quick answers to your very important question about partnering. Thank you. All right. All right, any other questions in the chat? I don't see any. How about right here in the room? Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Nancy. How much is um, how much is is your problem with um, better coordination and less fragmentation um, affected by the the funding you get? Is is the funding uh, that you get from uh, Congress? adequate and is it more a people problem or is it a funding problem or both hmm. so for for those online the question is is the funding you get 
adequate for NOAA. How, how, well, how much is it a problem with this particular problem of fragmentation? Yeah. Is that you just don't, if you don't have the, the funds for the kind of staffing you need to improve that? Yeah. Or how is much, it a people problem uh, and learning how, after you know several hundred years, how to how to coordinate better? Yeah. So fragmentation is is the question, and are you adequately funded, or is it a people problem uh, regarding fragmentation, like of this research? What Emma had just talked about. Thank the, you. The, 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 Uh, the short answer is it's both. Um, and let me talk about the resources first. And on the resources side, I, I mean, what's enough? How, how much do you need for your life? Well, the answer to that question is going to be based on what do you need to spend? So you're going to tell me, hey, my mortgage or rent is this, and I need this much for food. And in the end, you come up with a number. You say, my requirement is this. I can always do it more. So we've looked at our requirements. We've looked at how much if we were to do everything we are expected to do, by law that we are expected to do, uh, NOAA probably needs uh, close to $15 billion a year to do that. Our current budget, what we've put in is about seven. So that gives you one answer. So we have to make some trade-offs there. On the personnel side, um, th those two go hand in hand, because if we have more resources, part of that is to hire people as federal employees or contractors to do this work. Part of it goes out as grants to external stakeholders. So the two go hand in glove, I think. The other part of your question, and, and it gets back to Emma's uh, issue, is the degree of coordination and how we coordinate uh, between the agencies. We do it a lot better now. I've been in the government since 1987. And, and I remember when I first started, I never would sit down. I was a program manager. I was writing those checks, and I would very rarely sit down with my colleagues at NSF or at USGS at, or at the Army Corps of Engineers or at NASA. Now, um, we've developed a number of coordination mechanisms at, at the D.C. federal level where we're having a lot of discussions, we're drawing up a lot of plans, but the problem I just described about NOAA being a nominally a $15 billion agency with a $7 billion budget is the same in many of the other agencies. So I think the nation is facing a challenge of having adequate investment for many of these kinds of programs, which is why I was delighted when Congress passed the two bills that they've passed recently. It is some acknowledgement that we need more of these resources. But in terms of the coordination, any of these, these NOAA folks here in the room or on the screen for that matter, I can guarantee you, I used to talk about their Rolodex. I realize most of the people who work for me are too young to know what a Rolodex is. <laughs> most of the uh, people in NOAA have a pretty robust contacts list of folks in other agencies. And so I'm feeling pretty good that we're having that discussion reasonably well. But we are very, very limited on the resources that are available. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. It's okay. It's, it's like, here. no, it's like a tag team. And, and I think you've had it. We've all had a busy day. Um, May I ask a follow-up on that? Okay. We're going to get a follow-up question. And Jim, I see your hand up and we'll get to you after uh, this audience member's question. Um, the Department of Defense has one, a very, very large budget. And two, they're increasingly talking about domain awareness in the mm -hmm. Army. And I'm wondering how you work with them, particularly on National Weather Service data collection sites. Okay. So for the National audience. National Weather Service is somewhat, my understanding of the region has been downsizing or decreasing those sites or changing those sites, just as DOD is saying, oh, we need to do that. So I'm wondering if, if there's any collaboration there to assist in that or how could that be done? I think um, there was a new bill just passed that now talks about year-end presence of the military in support of NOAA. Right. And so does that also mean we're going to see year-end presence of NOAA research ships? If so, awesome. Mm -hmm. But but you know how, how do those collaborations work? Obviously, you and NSF makes good sense. Yep. What's that about? 
Okay, so the question then from the audience is, um, it's been noted that the Department of Defense in the Arctic, Peter, is that where you're going yeah. with that? Okay, in the Arctic has been increasing. At the same time, the National Weather Service for us uh, in the Arctic is decreasing. And that would be the, are you talking about the offices presence? And the, you know, the, the moving the snow measurement sites from the airport to a volunteer spot. Okay, mm -hmm. in specifically in the Bering Strait region, we've lost uh, a very long 100 and something year data set. I think is that what you're referring to? Okay, um, while we've, and also, so the question was, there's a large budget and how is that being dealt with? And the Arctic Commitment Act, which was introduced and was in the top of the gnome nugget last week. And that's the one where in Murkowski and the Senator from Maine want year round presence and want more information about what's being spent in the Arctic and year round presence of the Navy and the Coast Guard. And how does NOAA fit in with that? Okay, do we have till 11? All right. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, I'll check the time here, but wait, I've got to get the speaker down and... So thank you, Peter. And let me preface this by saying that, one, you may have heard in the intro that I worked for Navy for a lot of my career. Um, and it was on oceanography and meteorology, helping the Navy's programs there. And um, the other thing is I will share with you that I was, part of my duties when I was with Navy was as a supervisor for the National Ice Center, which is a center that is staffed and operated by Coast Guard, Navy, and NOAA. Um, and I bring that up because uh, in 2001, uh, when I was working for Navy, we developed a strategy for, and the, the title of the, the strategy was Naval Operations in an Ice-Free Arctic. The last briefing in the Pentagon that I did on that was on September 7th, 2001. Um, four days later, the world changed for us in the US. And I bring that up because just recently I saw that, dig, I, I moved and so I was digging through some old papers and I found that briefing, I looked at it. And so it was remarkably valid still. Uh, in fact, I would argue it was validated by the changes. Back then, we thought we were going to see some sea ice changes. Now we are seeing the sea ice changes. So I wanted to I wanted to give my sort of bona fides to you in terms of knowing the DOD relationship and understanding the priorities. And, and oh, by the way, back then in Navy, we were talking about, do we set up the Eighth Fleet in Nome? That was the discussion. Is there, a, is there an opportunity for building that out? Um, that I would prefer, Peter, since you're a reporter, that is for background, not, and, and uh, I don't want to say it's, well, it's off the record because I can't speak for Navy, obviously, but back then there was, I think, for background. Um, so uh, here we are now, and um, we have one of our political appointees. She's here in the building somewhere, Dr. Kelly Chris, who has responsibility for Arctic work, and she's been working a lot on the national security agenda. I wanted to make one of my priorities when I came here a visit to General Nahum, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his name correctly, Nahum, the new Alaska Command Director. And we had a very mean, meaningful discussion, including some classified briefings just, it feels like three years ago, it was two days ago, okay. two days ago. Um, and so I want to let you know that because when I look through some of the strategic documents about support for the national security mission and what DOD, and it's not just Navy, obviously, the whole maritime domain awareness piece, I felt our capabilities were not adequately present at the table. Now, and when I say our, I mean NOAA. And so I had that discussion with the general. Um, as you probably know, there is a new DOD center, the Ted Stevens Center for Arctic Security Awareness, I think, or Arctic Security. Um, we're talking, I'm talking with General Church Key, uh, who is their new director and, and is an old colleague of mine about what we might want to do as well. And a lot of those discussions hinge on services out of Nome. So one of the reasons I really wanted to be here was to actually walk the waterfront, see what the challenges are, see what the opportunities are. So what I'm really telling you is um, you're absolutely right. There is not a clear engagement here in the Arctic with DOD. There will be, however, 
And a lot of it is around the National Strategic Arctic strategy that's being developed. You asked a specific question about staffing associated with things like national weather sites. I'm concerned about the same thing. So I also, I don't have an answer for you on that. Staff has briefed me on it. I wanna look into that while I'm here. But I would also add that uh, we're looking at what are the solutions that we can take advantage of. NOAA has responsibility through the Weather Service to support DOD activities in domestic applications. So for example, you might, the, the example I like to use a lot is on the East Coast, when there's hurricanes bearing down on the East Coast, the worst thing in the world would be if the Atlantic fleet decided to, to sortie out of Norfolk, and we are telling the folks in Virginia, don't worry about the storm, it's not bad. Or the, the reverse, we tell everybody the storm's coming and the fleet decides to stay in port. So there's a very close coordination between us and Navy in that case. Same thing with Air Force. Uh, they obviously have, they being Air Force and Navy, have their own um, weather service support for their activities overseas. Um, so here in Alaska, there has to be close alignment between what we do and what DOD needs. And that's another part of the discussion that's being undertaken. So when I talk about, we talk about maritime domain awareness, part of this is, I would argue, maritime environment, or, or rather environmental domain awareness. And that's the discussion I want to have with Alcom uh, and with uh, Church Key as well. Did that answer your question? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. All right. You'll get me trained, yeah. We're gonna um, we're gonna overcome this technical difficulty. But next, uh, Jim Overland, thank you for your patience. Is, is it really Jim Overland? It is. I um, I just wanted to say I hope you can spend some time with the uh, gay tomorrow. The northern bearing. Go ahead, is, uh, Jim. The best example oh, of wait, an Arctic My uh, down. Run by uh, subarctic uh, species, and that's ongoing now. So that's all I wanted to add. Jim, can you repeat the question? Because I was slow on the draw. We're having the my technical spills, skills in this setting have been um, rerouted. So could you start your question again? We're all ears. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. I just wanted to say that uh, I hope you'll spend some time with Gay uh, tomorrow that uh, the Northern Bering is uh, the best example of an art ecosystem being overrun by subarctic species and it's an ongoing thing right now. Thank you. Uh, Jim, yeah, this is Rick. Thank you. It's a pleasure to hear your voice, Jim. Uh, thanks for joining today. I hope I get to see you at some point. Um, yeah, and I, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I actually uh, had a fascinating discussion with the senior leadership of Trident Seafoods, obviously one of the biggest processors here in the state. And they were talking about how they are seeing exactly that um, in, in their uh, activities. So it's researchers like you working uh, with the NOAA team that are gonna help us get a much better handle. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, and uh, Gay is a real uh, uh, source of knowledge that I have. <laughs> it's a little hyperbolic, but yes. <laughs> so in our region, we have more than animals dying. We have birds dying. Uh, we have ships coming up. We have ships coming through. Uh, we have development, mining, governmental, uh, transportation, infrastructure. So what steps do you take today? What steps do you, does NOAA take today to protect this land, uh, this water? You, you mentioned lives and lifestyles. Um, 
what steps does Noah take? What active steps does Noah take today? Sure. This is happening right now, and it's drastically affecting lives and lifestyles just here. Okay, so the question is from the audience talking about equity and underserved communities. We have seabirds dying, uh, animals dying in our ocean. We have ships, the big commercial ships here, cruise ships, big ships, industrial marine traffic, something like that, mining, transportation issues. Um, transportation infrastructure being built up. What steps does NOAA take to protect lives and lifestyles? I'm going to mute. Yeah, thank you for the uh, really important question. And uh, the short answer to your question is that I've talked mostly about our operational activities. We have a very strong regulatory role by law uh, associated with marine mammal protection, with endangered species, and of course, elements of the uh, Magnuson Stevens Fisheries Management and Conservation Act. Uh, we also have our own law enforcement component. Uh, we had a chance when we first got here, in fact, to ride with our OLE, Office of Law Enforcement Officers, out of Juneau to see what they were doing. Um, and I saw firsthand how they were working with the local community. In that case, it was with the um, whale watching ecotourism industry to make sure everybody was adhering to the rules and regulations associated with non-harassment of the humpback whales uh, there in Auk Bay, for example. Is it sufficient? Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna get the numbers right, but you could count the number of Office of Law Enforcement uh, officials on the coast, I think. I'm looking at Amy on two hands. You could count them. Yeah, for 40,000 miles of coastline. So we have the regulatory responsibilities. We also have responsibilities for um, biological opinions, for working environmental impact statements of activities. If there's development activity, whether it's associated with oil or even offshore wind, we have a responsibility of working with our partners, for example, in the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management to make sure those activities are done in compliance with federal regulations. So I'm comfortable that we have a foundation and a basis for carrying that out, but it's probably not sufficient in the light of some of the impacts that we are seeing both from pollution and from climate change and from development. So there are laws, there are operational capabilities, but many times it's chasing a very um, difficult problem with very limited resources. All Thank right. you. All right. Any other questions? Don't forget to put a little love in there for Dr. Spinrad for providing straight science. If there's nothing else in the chat and no other questions from the audience, I will thank Dr. Spinrat. Oh, Emma is back on. Emma, I see you. Good, good save. All right. Go, Emma. So I just wanted to tell you, Dr. Spinrad, thank you for being here and doing straight science. Um, I hope you'll add me to your robust list of contacts from NOAA. Gay is very great to work with, like you said, Alaska Sea Grant um, to help you remember the story of uh, connecting with the research vessel. Um, nobody has landlines anymore, so everybody has cell phones pretty much. They don't have landlines. And I know a lot of the commercial fisheries uh, activities were picking up. So I, I went down to the dock to look for um, commercial crabbers 
to start asking if anyone would allow us to charter a boat to go out and um, collect water samples in the ocean. And so, you know, I, I got some information verbally. I had, you know, some email me and text me. And so then I go back to Gay and I tell her, you know, oh, I was down at the docks because you don't have landlines anymore in town. So um, I didn't have everybody's cell phone numbers. So I went and looked around and looked around. So Gay started looking around and I brought this up in the Alaska Harmful Elgel Bloom Network. And so eventually Gay brought up um, this research vessel. So we're very fortunate to have the contact with Gay. And um, I hope what she does continues for a long time because she's very resourceful and has a lot of knowledge of this region to contribute to what we're starting up here within our tribal consortium. Holy cow, thank you, Emma. <laughs> very much appreciate that. Can I make a comment? Yeah. Yeah, Emma, thank you for bringing up the communication issue because I want to point out something. It's come up a few times as I've been uh, flying around the state, and that is, um, and, and I, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but one of the aspects of this bipartisan infrastructure law that was passed the last November was uh, $56 billion for broadband expansion throughout the U.S. Uh, through the uh, basically, the agency within the Department of Commerce responsible for telecommunications. Um, and the head of that agency is a guy named Alan Davidson, who was here in the state um, last week, I think. Um, he didn't get around to every part of the state, but my understanding is he got around to some of the um, rural, uh, super rural communities to talk about uh, communication capabilities. Um, I intend when I get back to talk with Alan a little bit more about some of the challenges for our mission associated with the communication issues you talked about. Ostensibly, if we are successful as a country in implementing those $56 billion, there won't be a place within the United States where you do not have adequate broadband access. That's the goal. And so if that were the case, a lot of, a lot of the kinds of issues we've been talking about here would be resolved. So I, I, you've got my commitment to try to take some of the environmental concerns and NOAA-related concerns of fisheries, harmful algal blooms, mapping and charting, back to Alan to talk about how that could be addressed with telecommunications improvements. The, the interesting um, point, too, is all the commercial fisheries or crabbing people that I spoke with at the dock. They'll probably see the Gnome Nugget article and say, oh, she found a boat. <laughs> well done, Emma. I'll put it in just for you. <laughs> um, can, can you handle two more questions? I, of course. OK, yeah. so um, right on. So I see Chad C um, and Vera Metcalf. So we'll take those two questions. I know it's uh, it's we're going over, but we started late, so that works. So go ahead, Chad C. What's your question? Thank you, Gay. Um, one, I wanted to uh, echo uh, Wes Jones's earlier comments about the Northern Bering Sea Survey and the value of that and extending it to the Chukchi Sea uh, for the, the fishery I participate in. My, my vessels are in the Pacific Cod fishery and we've seen many of the same kind of movement uh, north uh, expansion of the range, I should, really should say, um, as you might see with the pollock fishery and, and crab fisheries and that kind of research would be incredibly important for us uh, to understand uh, that that relationship there. Um, a question I had was, was you know, the U.S. Arctic is, of course, just one piece of the broader Arctic puzzle and uh, fish and currents don't, they don't know boundaries. Um, so uh, what kind of outreach would you envision with other Arctic countries, uh, particularly Russia, in, your, in achieving your Arctic goals uh, at, at the agency? And is there any near-term path to, uh, to doing that as well? Oh, sorry. I was listening to that. Oh, yeah. I'm dropping the ball.
Thank you. Chad, thank you for that question. Um, so it was interesting to watch uh, when this administration started, uh, where there were a lot of good um, messages about upping our game in the Arctic. So what you saw was this explosion of activity, whether through the Arctic Executive Steering Committee or our engagement with the uh, internationally on the Arctic Council or the um, rejuvenation of the Interagency Arctic Research Committee. Um, so there was a lot of activity and we got caught up in that as well at NOAA. And, and in fact, um, Dr. Kelly, Chris, who's here, it, her title is Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Fisheries, but I asked Kelly to take on the Arctic agenda too, because I wanted to demonstrate at the highest level of the agency, we're gonna start looking into this and I'm trying everything I can to actually put meaningful resources into this. Now, that wasn't your question, I know, but I say that because we were all set up, we had a lot of momentum and then Russia attacked Ukraine. And there was a lot of discussion about how do we deal with this? Obviously there's a political issue here. Um, there were some, nations in the Arctic club, if you will, that were saying we've got to sanction them, we've got to block the door, not let them into any of these discussions. And in fact, there was some discussion in, in one of these international councils about uh, actually ejecting Russia from sitting at the table. I think cooler heads have prevailed at this point. Don't get me wrong, what Russia did in Ukraine is abhorrent, but by the same token there, was a recognition that we have got to continue the dialogues with respect to fisheries management, with respect to uh, uh, sea lanes, uh, claim water claim or claims of uh, territory, if you will. So these activities are continuing. The discussions are going on. Uh, I have been advocating for a comprehensive US Arctic strategy, which would incorporate the aspects you alluded to. I'm, optimistic that we will be developing those strategies. There are clearly research strategies and there are uh, strategic um, defense national security strategies being developed, but for the uh, natural resources for fisheries, which is I'm sure what you're addressing, uh, we are continuing the discussion. Obviously the central Arctic uh, fishing uh, agreement is one that's moving along uh, as we speak. So my real message is there's a lot of momentum, a lot of coordination. The It's awful to use the word unfortunate. The unfortunate efforts by the or activities of the Russians have put a real crimp in that development. So I'm hoping that the situation in Ukraine can be resolved peacefully soon, and then we can get back to work a little bit more aggressively. I wish I had a better answer, but that's basically where we stand. Thanks for that. All right, thank you, Chad. And uh, and I guess I would just interject that you are in the Bering Strait region now. So when you think about Russia, there's Russians and there are our neighbors, which are Chukotkans, mm. if that helps you. Um, go ahead, Vera, you're up. Thank you so much for your patience. Um, you just have to unmute. Sorry. Um, hey, hey, Gay, it's actually Bob. Oh, hey, Bob. <laughs> Thanks, Gay. Um, this is a little bit of a, a takeoff of Barb's question, but uh, I, I appreciate Dr. Spinrad, your, your visit and the opportunity here. Uh, I was kind of struck with your um, uh, lives, livelihood and lifestyles as being um, ways of viewing the impact of NOAA activities. And uh, I guess from my viewpoint, I would really suggest kind of looking at those uh, in reviewing uh, how Alaska Native and Arctic Indigenous people um, fit in those categories. Uh, I, 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 I think that they're maybe um, fit differently and it should have a little different considerations as uh, the Arctic and Indigenous people and 
their heavy reliance on indigenous food security and uh, their longstanding cultural dependence on um, marine waters, uh, marine mammals, uh, and a healthy environment. So, um, you know, some people talk about stakeholders. Um, I know that uh, ICC, the uh, New Circuit Polar uh, Council, talks about being rights holders as uh, Ar Arctic Indigenous people. And uh, just food for thought uh, for you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Bob. Uh, no question. That was just more food for thought. No direct question. Yep. No, no okay. question. Just uh, food for thought. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Any other questions or going once? Go. Oh, go ahead. Oh, one more. Last one. Go ahead, Nancy. This is a follow up on what Bob was just saying. Um, and I know this isn't just a NOAA problem, but, but you know, it's a, a bureaucratic problem, it's a government problem. Um, before you leave the region, will you have a contact person or a contact uh, group here that you're specifically will be in contact with ongoing into the future regarding subsistence issues and things like Bob was talking about? Will you have a, a network that's firm so, so that you know, yeah. this, yes. this won't get lost. The so question, first, the okay. question, that's all right. The question from the audience was um, this isn't necessarily a NOAA question, it could be just a bureaucratic bigger problem. And that is when he leaves Alaska, when Dr. Spinrad leaves Alaska, will there be a contact group in the future to deal with some of the subsistence issues that was just uh, brought up? twice, but in that last question, especially recently. So Nancy, thank you. The short answer is yes. And I would argue it, we already have part of that through Sea Grant activity, through Amy Holman, who is Alaska, basically my belly button for Alaska regional activities. We also have a regional climate coordinator here, a woman named Jessica Cherry. But that's not sufficient, uh, especially for the issue you addressed with respect to working with subsistence fishing, subsistence hunting communities. This is one of the objectives that we're going after with the pilot project that I alluded to that came out of our roundtables. That is you know, the, the ANTHC activity that we've just started with them, I would hope. And, and, and in talking with their leadership, Val Davidson earlier today, and Anchorage, we both agreed this can't be a one and done. That great, isn't that good? We did a study, look at, it's got a pretty picture on the front of it. It's gotta be a sustainable activity to address these issues. So my commitment is to try to work to that. I can't tell you that by the time I get on the plane on Saturday afternoon, we will have solved that problem. But you also have my commitment to, to addressing that, which is why I would, this, that's one of the reasons I came up here. I don't want to just read about this. I want to see what we're doing for the sea ice walrus support activity that we're doing out of the fishery, uh, out of the uh, uh, weather service office. I want to see what we're doing to support communities that are facing critical questions about moving the village or moving the infrastructure. And I want to know that we are providing that. But you also, in your question, appropriately indicated this is not exclusively a NOAA issue. One of the things I will tell you that impresses me so much every time I come here to Alaska is the community of federal agencies and how they work together. I, I saw that when I was up in Gakvik. I saw that when I was in Anchorage a few years ago and had the chance to talk to Jim Kendall, who's a representative of the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. So I think some of that is already here. We just need to institutionalize it a bit more, a lot more. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I think we should probably give Dr. Spinrad a break. And so at this point, I will say um, again, thank you. And next week, next, it looks like it's going to be next Thursday for Straight Science. We will have Vera Metcalf with the Eskimo Walrus Commission. We'll be doing Straight Science. I don't know at this point if anybody wants to do a hybrid at this point, but um, we'll see if it'll just be back to Zoom or a hybrid. And 
she will be talking about the Eskimo Walrus Commission's Young Hunters Summit, which will be coming up in October. And it's a pretty exciting opportunity and a pretty exciting concept. So she wants to talk to all of us in the region about the Eskimo Walrus Commission's Young Hunters Walrus Summit. So with that, tune in next week. Thank you so much. Have a good night.